Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the third informal working group for Leadership Dialogue One. And this is all about a healthy planet for our prosperity, for prosperity for all, so an input towards the Stockholm Plus 50 um, international meeting. And we're only a couple of weeks away from that meeting, very exciting times. So in our um, informal working group, group today, what we would like to do is to really look at and explore a few of the recommendations that we can put as part of this preparatory process that we can put towards the international meeting on the 2nd and the 3rd of June. Um, and as we have been doing in, in these informal working groups, we're going to divide the, the discussion into four rounds to deal with four sets of, of recommendations. And we'll, we'll give you a brief overview of each of these um, before we open the, the floor for, for comments and for discussion. But before we do so, I would like to invite our co-hosts, um, Sweden and Kenya, and the co-chairs, Canada and Ecuador, to um, welcome us and to give their perspectives and their messages to this informal working group. Um, we have posted the housekeeping rules um, in the text, in the chat box. So uh, that's just an overview. We are recording this so that you're aware of that. <clears throat> and we will record it for, for record keeping purposes, but also maybe for prosperity, because it's a great moment in time to, to provide your views. <clears throat> Can I ask then Ambassador Joanna Lissinger of uh, Sweden to um, <clears throat> open the session for us, and then followed by Ambassador Njambi of Kenya. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kole, for giving the floor. And let me also start with, I think, thanking the UNEP team and our uh, <clears throat> distinguished co-chairs who has been guiding us throughout the informal process and in the discussions in New York, uh, and now just two weeks away from Stockholm. And I think it's, it's somehow worth taking a moment of just reflecting of where the journey this spring has led us uh, with, I think, a very strong inclusiveness and wide variety of voices on all of the informal working groups. But it's also uh, a moment in time when it's worth to take a step back and reflect upon what we as the global community have achieved over the 50 years since 1972. And not at least also, I think, what UNEP has achieved in uh, that role and putting environment very much heart to heart of the UN system. Um, and I wanted actually also to put today's discussion in the context of what has been laid out in the concept note as the expectations of Stockholm Plus 50. Where will Stockholm Plus 50 make a difference? And the concept note are speaking about the expectations around rebuilding the relationship of trust it speaks about accelerate system-wide actions. It speaks about connecting and build bridges across agendas and to rethink conceptions and measures of well-being. So um, today at this last uh, informal working group for this leadership dialogue, we have one to go tomorrow. Um, I would, as part of the co-host team here, I think also invite you to really put your interventions and messaging in the context of those expectations uh, and building, of course, what has already been achieved so far. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, my minister, Minister Annika Strandhel, uh, speak in New York at the, um, at the formal meeting there now a month back or so. And she also addressed three areas um, where we see that we can make a difference together with all of you in Stockholm. And that again is the systematic actions for a healthy planet and human well being that are bridging the agendas um, and looking beyond the silos and traditional measures of well being for growth. It's looking at closing the implementation gap uh, through partnership, through finance, aligned and scale up, scaled up. And it's also looking at the expanding the variety of voices, not at least the youth voices. So again, I'm sure uh, we will hear our able co-chairs 
um, that I also would, would really like to thank for the work that you have put down here, but I'm sure they will encourage you uh, to be very focused um, and concrete in your interventions today. Uh, but then also looking at where is it that we want Stockholms to make a difference and how can we contribute to those expectations uh, that we have built up uh, through this spring. Yesterday, I also had the opportunity to listen to um, one of the reports being launched ahead of Stockholm Plus 50. We welcome a note now, quite a lot of different statement reports just being launched in, from different stakeholders. And this was a report from um, Stockholm Environment Institute together with CEEW from India. Um, and that report is somehow speaking about keys to unlock a better future. Um, and it identified um, the redefining of a relationship between human and nature. It spoke about ensure prosperity that lasts for all. And it spoke about investing in a better future. Um, and I was thinking of what came out from that scientific report and then looking at what is coming out from the regional consultations, the national consultations from New York, from the informal working groups as this one and the messaging there. And it's quite, I think, amazing to see how there is a strong alignment of messaging coming out from all of these different activities that has taken place this spring. And I have to say also that I think it looks it makes me look forward even more uh, to Stockholm two weeks from now and to the leadership dialogues. Um, and I feel also, I think, very confident uh, that we will be able to have a very constructive, focused and discussion there uh, with a contribution of messaging from the different leadership dialogues leading to a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. Uh, and with that, I thank you and uh, also our, of course, thanks to our dear uh, co-hosts um, in this journey uh, and our friends from Kenya. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lessinger. And thank you to Cecilia for posting the report. Indeed, that report was launched um, yesterday. Uh, no, yes, yesterday. Um, and as you say, I encourage all of you to have a look at some of the reports coming from the national consultations, the regional consultations, they, there is incredible convergence in terms of the urgency to act, but also the kinds of things that we as individuals, as, as businesses, as governments, as international organizations can do and, and work together to advance sustainable development and deliver on the SDGs. I must say, I think uh, Kenya is, might, have be, might be having technical problems joining um, we are looking at um, working, sorting that out, um, and maybe I can give them an opportunity um, in a moment as soon as they are able to join. I would therefore like to turn to the co-chairs of Leadership Dialogue 1, um, and this is uh, Ecuador and Canada, and I'm going to ask um, Walter Schuert of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador, please, for your um, perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. Uh, and uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone. Uh, very, very glad to be here in this third and, and last session of the uh, informal working group uh, towards all this, this rich process towards Stockholm Post 50. And of course, uh, thanks to, to Ambassador Johanna and Ambassador Niyambi for the co hosts for uh, again for the invitation uh, to us to, to be able to co-chair with, uh, together with Canada's Ambassador Dion, this, this very, very, very uh, rich process, as, as I said. Uh, during, at, at this stage, we, we would like just to, to highlight a few points of all these contributions that we have been uh, gathering from the different tracks, but in particular from the track of this uh, session, previous sessions of the, of the um, informal working group. Uh, it, it is clear that there is a, a more and more a, evident convergence a, of the messages from, from all the different uh, stakeholders. And uh, very, very encouraging to see also that they really go into the direction of the assessment of an urgency that we all have been put uh, uh, as, as one of the, the starting points for this, for this conference, uh, that such assessment of the current situation of the triple planetary crisis that uh, the UN Secretary General has been referring uh, quite often and in a different forum has uh, 
potential uh, and, and very clear solutions if we really uh, accelerate the actions the global uh, in, in a global manner. Uh, and for that, uh, I, I think it is clear that uh, we have uh, the, the pathways that have been uh, mentioned, uh, Johanna uh, mentioned some of them, the need to rebuild uh, uh, the connection or the, the relationship with nature, the, the need to connect what everyone is doing, uh, and rethink a relationship uh, and bridge the, the different uh, and, and strengthen the synergies between the different um, actions and commitments that we are uh, that are needed for, to accelerate the implementation of, of, of uh, everything that we have uh, done and agreed in, in these 50 years. Uh, and, and we want to strengthen on the world connection because uh, we have seen through this process uh, both at, the, um, at all levels, at the national level, through the national consultations as well. Our, our country was one of the, the, the countries that participated in this process of national consultations with also very rich uh, messages and concrete proposals and ideas but also the Latin American and all the regional consultations that we have been uh, participating and observing and, and the, this, this global process. Uh, and we see that there is a lot of action. There are very, very concrete measures, some of them with very successful experiences uh, in, in terms of how to uh, really, really transform uh, scale uh, and the um, initiate or in some cases continue a, a process of, of just transition, a, a transformation of, of the patterns of consumption and production, a mitigation and adaptation a action, a biodiversity a restoration, a many in many, so many different fronts now with growing action also on, on oceans. A, but we need to really connect all those important and, and successful stories a, and actions a, at the different levels in, into a more global and, and a scale, a scalable um, programs, projects, uh, policies, with uh, for for which we need also to connect with the, with the finance uh, side and and the importance of the MISO implementation that also Johanna mentioned. So uh, this is perhaps the the point that uh, in which I would like to 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 encourage everyone to in in their participations to really create, provide those concrete messages concrete actions and and if you can also how to connect them because this will be the the, the rich and perhaps most successful result of stockholm plus 50 uh, from our point of view just to uh, encourage everyone to to participate uh, the inclusivity of this process uh, is is with no doubt very clear but uh, and this has to be maintained and we hope to see uh, to hear all the proposals from all the different stakeholders also that are participating uh, governments uh, private sector academy young youth uh, gender and, and other uh, organizations and, and individuals as well so with that uh, i will give you the floor and of course looking forward to hear all the different proposals uh, from today thank you Muchas gracias, Mr. Shield. Thank you so much for, for those uh, guidance, for the guidance, and also for emphasizing the, the connections and using this opportunity to really work across our silos and, and make sure that we can connect the agendas. Without further ado, if I can hand over the hand the floor, give the floor, hand over to uh, Special Envoy Stefan Dion, please, of Canada, also co-chair for Leadership Dialogue One. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, as Walter has done, I would like to insist in the, in, during the few minutes I have on the very importance of the recommendation that we will hear coming the two next hours. Thanks to our two co-presidents, um, Ambassador Kim Yung Gu and Ambassador Lissinger Peitz, as well as UNEP, we are holding today our third and final meeting of the informal working group for the Leadership Dialogue One of the Stockholm Plus 50 Conference. It seems a bit complex, but it's very, very important what we will do today. We are May 19th. The Stockholm Plus 50 Summit is June 2nd and 3rd. It is fast approaching two weeks from now. Hence, the great importance of this third uh, of three informal working groups meetings. Our task today, is to identify concrete recommendations to achieve a healthy planet for all now and in the future. Recommendations that will provide context for the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. To do this, it is useful to take stock of our two previous informal working groups. It's, it's a building effect that what we are doing. We need to accumulate the knowledge through these working groups. 
And uh, the two first ones were held on March 10th and April 22, uh, 20, 22nd. In a nutshell, what was said can be summed up in three words, ambition, urgency, and team spirit. First, ambition. We speak about reconciling humanity with the planet, which means nothing less than reversing the global current trend, which too often relies on self-destructive development. We need to find sustainable development paths that future generations can also benefit from. Second, urgency, urgency. Only yesterday, the World Meteorological Organization came with a very worrying report. In fact, if you, we look at the 2015 Paris Agreement, we were committing to limit global warming to below, well below two degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees. Unfortunately, this report confirmed again that we are not doing it, going in this path at all. Many of our countries though, uh, including Canada, have committed to reach carbon neutrality for 2050. It seems far away 2050, no, it's tomorrow. Because in fact, what we are talking of nothing less than transforming in a few decades, the material basis of our industrial revolution, the energy produced by the combustion of fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal. This means that as soon as possible, we must electrify our transport, capture CO2, deploy renewables, deploy clean hydrogen. In short, make sure that everything we talk about in a dialogue like this one becomes in a few years, clean, affordable, large source of energy. All this in addition to better protecting forests, restoring green cover, and improving the health of our oceans. So ambition, urgency, and I said a third word, it's team spirit. As Walter said, team spirit, collective action, acting together because everything is connected. To a global problem, we need a global solution. We need to coordinate our approach to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss and prevent pollution. Everything is so much interconnected as evidenced by the teams of our four round tables. Look at that. The quest for a healthy planet must go hand in hand with economic progress and all of our sustainable development goals. That's round table one. With also fair multilateralism, round table two. With respect for human rights, round table three. Integrated and joint approaches will be needed to effectively address climate change, restore ecosystem, prevent pollution, and reduce disaster risk, round table four. These solutions must be collective. For example, a fair and efficient international carbon pricing system is a tool we need and that we must build together. Alas, while we urgently need to work together and to focus on a relationship with, with the planet, the last thing we needed was another war. What a terrible misfortune for Ukraine and all of the victims of this war, but also for humanity, which will once again lose its energy to war and destruction instead of combining its efforts to reconcile itself with our planet. The last data available shows that total global military spending is three times higher than all major global climate related primary investments. I'm sorry, Ambassador, we lost the sound. Yes. Thank you. Do you. I was saying that the fact that humanity is spending three times as much money to protect itself against itself as it does to protect itself against the climate change crisis is a catastrophe that President Putin's war will only make worse. We already had enough challenges to face without this completely unjustified new war. Despite this new obstacle, we must move towards a healthy planet. We must act with urgency, ambition, and team spirit. You see the crucial importance of the recommendations you will make in our next two hours. No pressure on you, but it's very important. It's crucial what you will do. I thank you for your engagement and look forward 
with great interest to your interventions. Uh, Madam Pretorius, our moderator, dear Cornelia. I, I, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for the energy and, and for the clear direction and, and also speaking to the, the teamwork and the urgency of the actions and the interconnectedness. So without further ado, um, let's go in and, and talk about some of those recommendations. And if the Secretariat can put up a slide, I'm going to do this at great risk. What we're not trying to do is to, to diminish the very rich set of contributions that we received throughout the, the preparatory process, the informal working group process, the preparatory meeting itself, and also through written submissions. I simply want to give you an idea of these are the key messages that are emerging from the, um, the process so far. And I'm going to invite uh, three initial speakers to guest speakers to, to speak to this. The first is Marcelo Bahar, Vice President of Sustainability of Natura & Co, David Passavalli, Executive Director of UNU, and Melina Sakiyama, Co-Founder of the Global Youth Biodiversity um, Network, as first respondents. If the Secretary can just move the slide maybe with to the next one. Um, voila, but those are the issues that we were covering in this leadership dialogue um, that was identified right from the start, uh, as you can see on the screen, transforming our relationship with nature, producing and consuming sustainably and fighting pollution, justice, inclusion, and intergenerational equity. And this comes back to the point also that we know this transition needs to happen and it needs to be a fair and a just transition. It's not going to be, it's not a short-term solution that we will be uh, for us to really address climate change and, and uh, the loss of biodiversity. These are long-term changes that we need to plan in. Um, on the next slide is just, I think the, um, if you can move the slide on, please. I don't know whether it's slow because it's a large file. Well, uh, there you go. So it has come already through the intervention so far, um, out, act collectively and with urgency, holistic and integrated solutions, new measures of progress, uh, scale up, effective mitigation and adaptation action, and align financial flows to reduce greenhouse gas em emissions and reverse biodiversity loss. What we are going to be asking specifically from the interventions also is to help us articulate who should do this, who should lead the change, where lies the responsibility. Um, and maybe I can invite Masala Baha from Natura as the first speaker um, to give his views, please. Masala, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Merci, Corley. I don't know if you can see me, I think, the administration, yes, now I think I'll be seen by you. Yes, here I am. Wonderful. Yes, hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Marcelo Behar, I am Brazilian, currently based in London. I represent Nature & Co, which is a global group that started in Brazil and operates with the Brazilian biodiversity for over 20 years. So we understood a uh, long time ago that it was important not only to have an operation that is carbon positive, but nature positive mostly. And by doing so, we are currently protecting over 2 million hectares of the Amazon forest, which is not enough. And we know it's far from um, being, being something that can be um, what will really drive change. So we engage with many other institutions like the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, um, T TCFD. And we understood, and I think here's my contribution, I think we were able as a global society to set the carbon agenda. We all know what public, what public policy is related to the carbon agenda. We have the NDCs in place. Each country via the Paris Agreement knows where it is and where it should be within five years. We do have metrics for the private sector with science-based targets for carbon. We do have metrics also for finance with TCFD, the Task Force 
for financial disclosure for carbon. And we do have the IPCC with the scientific metrics for carbon. We don't have any of those instruments for nature. And I think we can only evolve and we can only reach something meaningful in the next 50 years if we place the same metrics for the four players in the same amount of importance. So what we have today is CBD uh, under the public sector with the NBCEPs, which are a good effort, but far from being as accurate as the NDCs. And we must evolve on that direction. On the scientific agenda, I've been talking and we've been discussing a lot with Johan Rockstrom from the Potsdam Institute, probably having metrics under planet boundaries for nature would be something that would clarify and connect the public sector with the science sector. And with that, we would evolve under science-based targets, not only for carbon, but also science-based targets for nature, something that is being moved on, but there is a lot of work to do. And finally, I think connecting the finance sector and allowing not only projects that can have an impact on business and that can have um, risks and that are nature related, but mostly financing projects that will drive the regeneration that Monsieur Dion uh, um, was proposing. And I think we must not only operate in a way that is less harmful, but it's more regenerative. It will only come via finance change and via the finance sector aligning and allowing all those changes to happen. So that is our framework. That's how Nature Co has been operating, uh, trying to move those four agendas as a private sector uh, um, company and in constant dialogue with others. Um, I think that's it. That's my center contribution. So moving to Stockholm plus 50, my final recommendation would be let's organize the nature agenda and let's connect nature agenda with the climate agenda. Because if we just take a look at what's happening in the Amazon region, this year, 100 million trees were taken down. That is unacceptable to not have any more value to the biggest common goods on earth that is reaching its tipping point. Unless we do this something, this year, the situation might get really critical. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcella. It is, um, and great points, and also for bringing up or, or making the connection to the financial sector and the connection in the financial sector and in the corporate sector between climate and nature. These are all critical points. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, the next speaker on the list, I hope uh, David is still here. David, I know you have many pressing um, obligations this morning in New York, but uh, if you're still here, please take the floor. Oh, you are. Hi, Carly, can you hear me? Oops. Yes, I Thank can. You. Excellent, good, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone, colleagues. Um, Ambassador Dion, thank you for welcoming uh, me to this uh, conversation. I will try to be as uh, brief as possible, um, but the task that I've been given is a difficult one. Um, the UNU Center for Policy Research was invited to work with UNEP in the lead up to Stockholm Plus 50 to collect um, a, a series of perspectives from 10 authors, uh, indigenous communities, philosophers outside of the traditional policymaking circle and to bring those ideas to Stockholm. We have a project page with those papers and we will be having a launch event on 2 June, but I'm here going to try to uh, suggest or at least share with you several insights emerging from these papers and I will try to be as succinct as possible. I think what these papers try to do is offer a transdisciplinary focus and a challenging progressive narrative about our place, humanity's place in the environment and the long-standing problematic separation of humans, other species, and the ecosystem. And our authors attack this problem in different ways, again, looking at the economy, looking at philosophy, looking at um, the galaxy also. We have an astrobiologist who's written some interesting perspectives. Um, the ideas, we wanna communicate three ideas. First, there is a term that has emerged from uh, our Maori um, political philosopher, called relational repair, arguing that what we need is a space to face generations past and generations future, and not to view future generations as a powerless generation, as sometimes is the case in the discussion of intergenerational justice or equity, 
but rather to view them as descendants and a community, importantly, that will one day evaluate our hopes, our aspirations, and our actions, and how we are remembered. And I would invite you to read her paper on relational repair. It's an interesting concept for Maori philosophy. And frankly, we do not have structures or spaces at the moment that allow for this relational repair to take place. Second, we want, we would encourage that at Stockholm Plus 50, we demystify and challenge the idea that degrowth has no place in our vocabulary and in our common future. Large chunks of our economy are organized around an idea of accumulation and accumulation perpetuate, perpetuates injustice between the global north and south. We argue that there are different ways of organizing the economy, and this begins with, in terms of recommendations, democratizing the institutions of global economic governance, such as the World Bank, the IMF, the w and the WTO. It's, I think, important to observe that we, we are living at a moment when the Secretary General is very publicly calling the global financial system morally bankrupt. That is powerful language. It's, it's an incentive really to engage in the redesign of the global financial system and to see how we can make it more inclusive. Third, and finally, um, we would ask that we not give up for the sake of urgency, the investment that has already been made in understanding how the behavioral sciences can move the agenda forward. And UNIP has been a leader here. They have taken some really interesting innovative actions, trying to adopt the idea of nudges and incentives in the behavioral space. We argue that we need three incentives at least. We need incentives to unlock data monopolies. We need incentives to strengthen networked accountability, not just state accountability. And we need incentives to combat climate apathy. Um, all of these ideas are, are, uh, are elaborated in our papers. Um, I, I'm running out of time, so I will stop here to allow for, for discussion. I am sorry that I can't be with you for the entire session. Um, I'm at our governing board meeting, and so we'll have to leave you shortly. Uh, but thank you, Corley, for, for inviting me to speak on behalf of our authors uh, at this leadership dialogue. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for providing those dimensions beyond the, the sort of the hard science that we work. And this is also very important cultural philosophical framing questions for us all. And as you say, you could very well provide the key to reorganizing or the re thinking about how we reorganize our societies. Thank you so much for, for that intervention. I'm to give the floor to Melina in a moment, but I would like to call on um, the following speakers that uh, I will ask just after that, if you could please raise your hand so that the technical team can identify you. So uh, it includes uh, Najma Mohammed of the Green Economy Coalition, Alan Danger of Welcome, Sebastian Trung of Conservation International, um, and Leonie Gross of the European Commission, please. But first uh, to Melina, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Carly. Um, I hope you all can hear me and thank you so much. I'm very honored to be part of this really exciting and, and interesting conversation. And I am very happy to be speaking now because it was just um, after Ambassador Johanna talked about um, the issue of rebuilding trust. And then um, Ambassador Stefan talking talking about like bringing back the team spirit, and like as a fellow Brazilian like Marcelo, I'm really happy to see you bringing forward the issue of the Amazon as a collective good, right? So we are all talking about what is happening globally and what is happening collectively. And coming from my community, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, um, we can't forget that nowadays like 50% of the global population is below 35 and that this is like David said is not like a powerless community but is a community that has been alienated and marginalized for centuries for decades and not centuries right and like we are given we did a similar effort um a similar exercise in a much uh perhaps smaller scale than in stockholm but we did consult our community we consulted hundreds of young people from over 150 countries in the world to understand what were their vision 
for the future. And it's really interesting because I just glanced through over the report that was mentioned that was released by the Stockholm and en Environment in Institute um, on the youth charter. And the priorities are really similar. So for young people in our community, like the priority should be like a living sustainably, a society living sustainably, um, respecting the conditions of the life support system. So like really the resilience of our life support system and rights and equity. So justice for nature and people. And I think that this issue of justice is really important because in order for us to rebuild the trust between generations and between people and nature, between like all communities in this planet, we really need to go back to the truth and go back to morals, like David was saying at, at the end. I think like we know for decades what we have to do. We are living as if there is no tomorrow. We are consuming as if there's no tomorrow. Our only priority is maximizing profit. And this is the maximum like priority for the society. This cannot go on. We, we cannot live like this. And I think young people for long, I think they realize they know that they see what this maximum of profit does to all the other communities. We are the community that is majorly affected, right? So I think like what young people wants to see is like the how. So how can we really start rebuilding this world, repairing this relationship with nature based on principles that come from a more diverse, more inclusive, and more equitable voices around the planet, right? So enough with tokenism, enough with greenwashing, enough with empty promises. I think like we've seen many of these declarations, many of these recommendations telling us what to do, and they are basically similar. I was not there in Stockholm. Um, I was, I, I, even in Rio plus, uh, Rio summit, I was, really young, so I don't know, but people really talk about the sense of commitment and the sense of like honesty, you know, and responsibility, true responsibility at that time. And I think this is what we really need. You know, um, the secretary general said like morally bankrupt. I think our society is morally bankrupt at the moment. And unless we really go back to the principles that unite us all and that really, bring us together in an equitable, just way, like we will not move forward. So I really want to see the rights and the equities being truly implemented and being reflected at every decision-making process so that we start building a different story and not the same old empty promises. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Melina. And, and Stockholm is all about putting in place the mechanisms to translate commitments into action. And this is really some of the, the recommendations that we're also seeking, you know, can how much are needs to be part of voluntary efforts from say government and how much of businesses and how much needs to be in partnership as, as uh, was said earlier, as collective action partnerships between business and, and governments how much could be affected through um, policy changes in regulatory frameworks. So it's really these kind of recommendations and, and the inputs that looking at your, your system enablers or your system systemic changes that you can create. Um, but your message is, is very well heard. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. So let's look at, let's go to the, the list of speakers that I, that I briefly uh, mentioned earlier. So first on the list, I had Najma, please, from Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hope I'm coming through clearly. So um, my name is Najma Mohammed. I'm from the Green Economy Coalition, um, a global alliance of organizations um, committed to a just transition to a green and fair economy. So in our submission to the to this leadership dialogue, we really posed one big question is how do we accelerate the green transformations of our economies and societies and rebuild trust and renew the social contracts that actually fit for the challenges that we're facing? And we, we propose five areas of action. I think at the moment we um, recognize that we're actually subsidizing our own destruction to the tune of $1.8 trillion by the last count. So we need to 
undo that rapidly and, and recognize the dependence of livelihoods and economies on, on functioning and healthy um, ecosystems. We need to rebuild and revive narratives of our interconnectedness with nature that was so wonderfully put by an earlier speaker around rebuilding you know, that relational repair and, and new ways of understanding our relationship with nature, because that's really at the core of, of our second recommendation, which is we need to design new types of, of economies. And so I think um, this is, you know, we need new economic pathways. We need more courageous politicians and policymakers that can actually adopt, you know, principles such as planetary boundaries, justice, sufficiency, good governance within the economic pathways and to, to scale the existing pathways that we have, like well-being, circularity, social and solidarity um, and sufficiency economies. And lastly, we need, echoing our last speaker, an inclusive transition in which all voices are heard People have a stake in the design and delivery of our policies and investments. And we propose that we need a new, um, just and inspiring social contract, one which is intergenerational, one that can spur the transformation of economies and societies to address inequalities, halt climate change and environmental destruction, and build a safe climate, a healthy planet and, and prosperous societies for, for the current and, and generations to come. I'll, I'll post more in the chat, but we'd, we'd like to invite you to an associated event that, that we're proposing to hold around Stockholm Plus 50. Thank you. I was muted. Sorry about that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Najma. And yes, please post in the chat. There's a, a live chat activity happening with lots of interesting uh, reports and, and comments being posted. So please do post. Um, relevant materials there also. And thank you also for alerting to the event in Stockholm. I have next on the list, Alan Danger. I think I saw earlier online, if Alan, there, there you go, thank you. Lovely, thank You're you. Uh, welcome, Hugh. Director of Climate and Health, please. Thank you very much. A huge thank you to you. I'm the Director of Climate and Health at Welcome. Welcome is an independent charitable foundation based in London. Um, I would like to, uh, so first of all, huge uh, congratulations on these recommendations, which are, which are enormously powerful. Um, if I may, um, there is something I'd like to uh, uh, request, which is the, a slightly greater focus on human health, not just the health of the planet. Um, uh, because clearly the, uh, the environmental climate crisis is also a health crisis. And we, uh, we are aware of the huge impacts on health of climate change, of the substantial potential for health benefits accruing from mitigation actions, and, and from the importance for governments to recognize their role to protect the health of their populations in the face of climate change. And at the moment, uh, the, uh, the action on health is very limited are very disjointed um, and, and nowhere near sufficient uh, for us to, to really protect both the planet and human health. Um, and I would love uh, if there was greater evidence, greater statements of that in the recommendations uh, so that we can, reflecting on your earlier comments, uh, Corley, uh, so, so we need the evidence so that we can trust the evidence uh, for action. We desperately need to accelerate, as you say, uh, the, uh, uh, and we need to rethink uh, how, uh, how our responses can protect both the planet and human health. And if I may, uh, we uh, so suggesting uh, into the primary recommendation health and well-being rather than just well-being, I think would be a major contribution because the health argument uh, is can be hugely powerful if used uh, appropriately. And I will uh, welcome it is committed to uh, uh, to funding significant efforts on the links between climate and health, and I will insert some information about that uh, into the chat now. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thanks to you, Ellen. Um, next over to Sebastian, great to see you online. Please go ahead. Likewise, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Corley. And um, I think that as we prepare for Stockholm Plus 50, clearly there is broad agreement that since 1972, the world has made tremendous advances in terms of economic development, but at the same time has made less progress on social equity. And the economic development over the last 50 years has come at a very high environmental cost, putting the planet in a cr climate crisis and creating a nature loss crisis and thereby threatening human well-being and even existence. So given the interconnected nature of the existential threats to life on earth, 
We need to find solutions and pathways that generate win-win results for people and the planet. And two concrete solutions available to us and that I believe should be prioritized by governments, companies, investors, and civil society are firstly, pandemic prevention by reducing tropical deforestation and better managing wildlife and domestic animals that would simultaneously reduce the risk of future pandemics while generating climate benefits and addressing biodiversity loss. In short, conservation of nature is public health. Secondly, conservation of irrecoverable carbon. The carbon that's stored in ecosystems like mangroves, tropical forests, and peatlands, especially in Amazonia that we've heard about, but also the Congo Basin and forests in Southeast Asia in countries like Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And that if lost, could not be recovered on a timeline relevant for us meeting the Paris Agreement targets. This would make an essential contribution to tackle the climate crisis, but also would conserve biodiversity and secure a sustainable future for all those who depend on these ecosystems for their livelihoods, including indigenous peoples on host territories, more than a third of the world's irrecoverable carbon can be found. So let's save the world's irrecoverable carbon for the benefit of all. These two things would make a tremendous contribution uh, to a, a better planet and is something that I would welcome to see uh, elevated at Stockholm Plus 50. Thank you, Corley. Wonderful, thank you so much, very clear. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, next on the list, I have Leonie Gross. And then after that, Constanza Prieto, please. Leonie first, please. Uh, yes, thank you. I hope I'm audible. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunities to speak today. Thank you for organizing the round. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the European Union and its member states. And um, regarding message one, we would like to stress on the importance to promote the importance of holistic approaches and synergies between climate, biodiversity, and other environmental actions and enhance synergies and co-benefits between them in order to ensure a sustainable transition. Um, also, we would like to promote global initiatives and alliances launched to decarbonize the economy, for instance, uh, via COP26, the international public support for the clean energy transition or zero emission vehicle transition as well as global initiatives to advance and facilitate conversation and circular economy and sustainable use of natural resources and materials. We welcome the elaboration by the UN Statistical Commission of a new set of economic indicators taking into account the well-being of societies, including climate and environmental indicators to be used alongside the currently used GDP. And we commit to the adoption and urgent and effective implementation of a new global biodiversity framework at COP15 of the CBD. And then, although I'm talking on message one officially, I would like to use the reminder of my time to stress a little more on message four um, that is very dear to us in the member states, especially on promoting circular economy as a tang tangible and useful approach and advocate its incorporation into national and regional strategies to achieve sustainable production and consumption and combat climate change and biodiversity loss. And especially to recommend to the United Nations General Assembly to establish a sustainable consumption and production forum or dialogue within the ECOSOC to accelerate achievement of the SDG 12 and related SDGs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leonie. And the circular economy approaches sustainable consumption production very much part of this leadership dialogue and thank you for for mentioning it up front uh, already and some of the other um, recommendations messages that you gave um, are also relevant of course to leadership dialogue two and three so um, this is something that we are very mindful of but we are very open and welcome these messages here today uh, next up is Constanza. I saw you. Yes, there you are. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Constanza. I work for Erlo Center, an organization uh, who promotes um, uh, and advocate for the recognition of right of nature. Uh, we are very pleased in, in the recommendation. We see uh, the introduction of holistic approach, but uh, we think uh, it is need uh, a, a stronger language 
uh, addressing um, the recognition of right of nature, our recommendations are, uh, are especially in number one for a healthy planet. Um, and we think uh, even though we celebrate the introduction of uh, right-based approaches, we think uh, it need to be defined. And in that definition, we think uh, the right of nature or, or uh, air law uh, um, language should be part of the definition of uh, the right basis approach. Um, um, let the right basis approach undefined uh, is a risk because until now has been used um, to, um, uh, to put in the center the human needs. We think it is a really need um, um, to introduce a language that seek to protect and promote uh, both uh, human rights and right of nature, and also um, incorporate the uh, indigenous rights and the indigenous, uh, um, indigenous uh, perspective. Also, uh, we have a second recommendation in the in the third point, and uh, we think it really need to link the right uh, uh, of a clean, uh, healthy, and sustainable environment with the right of nature. That has been the perspective and the progressive interpretation of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, so we think it is need to introduce this kind of approach and perspective. In in, uh, in the in the recommendation in this document. Thank you so much. We will uh, submit our our full recommendation in the chat. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Constanza, for that um, contribution. The final speaker for this round is Patricia Heidegger from the European Environment Bureau, please. And then we'll go to round two on effective and fair multilateralism. I don't know if Patricia is online. Um, let's have a look. Ah, please, yeah, if uh, the technical team can um, just enable Patricia, please. There you go. Yes, here I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sorry for the slight delay. Um, so yeah, I'm Patricia Heidegger. I'm from the European Environmental Bureau. We are the largest federation of environmental citizens organizations in Europe. And uh, we also co-organized um, the regional multi-stakeholder consultation for Stockholm Plus 50. Um, and I'd like to share a couple of messages from, from those consultations. So uh, what we discussed quite at length um, at the regional consultation with regards to this uh, leadership dialogue is that we would like to see a strengthening of the language on human rights, intergenerational justice, gender equality and equity. Um, we discussed that we have already hundreds of multilateral environmental agreements and um, these need to be implemented and we would like to see a strong call on all governments and all levels of governance to uh, put those into um, reality. Uh, we also discussed environmental rights. Um, in the European region, we have, with the Aarhus Agreement, a very strong instrument. Um, the Escazú Agreement has just held its first um, meeting of the parties, so we would like to see a strong recognition of environmental rights for all, um, for all people, for all regions um, of the world. Other colleagues have mentioned um, the, the, the next steps um, for the full recognition of the human right to healthy, clean and sustainable environment. We would like to see a clear development um, or a next uh, step emerging from Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, the protection of environmental defenders is, of course, another topic which is uh, close to our hearts, in particular the protection of uh, indigenous defenders, women and youth environmental defenders, um, where we would like to see a clear support um, um, emerging from um, the discussions at Stockholm Plus 50. Um, also, um, a stronger link between environmental protection, climate action and, and gender equality. We see in our region that many environmental and climate policies are still entirely gender blind, for instance, transport policies, energy transition policies, agricultural policies. So uh, we need that recognition not only in paper, but in actual um, policy making um, processes. And last but not least, um, and this has been mentioned before by many others as well, that ecocide needs to be recognized um, in the Rome statutes as an international crime. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank for for bringing a whole wide range of, of issues and messages together. We will get back to um, many of the aspects around human rights and, and, and justice also in the third round of the discussions. Um, so let's move on to the um, to the next set of messages, and that is around effective and fair multilateralism. And this is part of global collaboration, enables the implementation of existing commitments. And we have touched on some of the, the interventions and some of the perspectives already in terms of the ability to, to implement um, these commitments. Access to finance is a, is a really important aspect to it, and especially when it relates to, to climate-related finance, um, adaptation, mitigation related. But there's another very important part to working together within and among countries, and that is around building capacity, sharing science, knowledge, and technology. So um, let me just go to my oops, the first speaker. Yeah, so I'm going to first call on, on two speakers, Dr. Aza Karam, who is uh, Secretary General um, for Religions for Peace and member of the High Level Advisory Board on the Future of Multilateralism. And then also going to call on Yulia Uliva, who is yet Head of Policy at uh, UNEP WCMC. Dr. Karam, please go ahead. Thank you very much indeed for this opportunity to learn from everything that has been said so far. And I just have a few points which are intended to be uh, critically provocative. Um, so bear with me a second. I think we've heard some excellent information. I believe that quite frankly, the answer to the questions that you kindly uh, posted for us to think about in terms of how can we, what recommendations and how can we ensure implementation requires two basic transformative aspects, a transformation of our institutions, all our existing current institutions, whether financial, political, religious, cultural, social, all our institutions are currently suffering what one person said in the words of the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, a state of moral bankruptcy and thorough inefficiency. The fact that we are now, as we heard from Ambassador Dion, we are now back at war not just in one country, by the way, but in many, almost every single corner of the world, we have a war, an actual armed conflict taking place, at least one, but there's actually many. The fact that we're in this space today shows that every single one of the institutions that we are confronted with and that we have and that we indeed rely on is morally bankrupt and politically deficient. So we need a transformation of our institutions but this requires fundamentally a transformation of behaviors and attitudes. We heard David speak earlier to behavioral science and how this has long been ignored. That is absolutely true. However, if you look at the behavioral science approaches and the notions that we have today in terms of innovation, we find quite frankly that we are talking about exactly the same things we have been speaking about for the last 100 years at least. Clearly something else has to change. I remember very distinctly that we still do not wish to speak about culture as though culture is the lesser marginal brother or sister of our existence when in fact it is the quintessential essence of our existence. Our cultural mindsets need to change to be transformed fundamentally. What has been missing in the last 75 years of the United Nations multilateral existence is this appreciation of the role of religions, not just of one religion, but of religions as very fun foundational to culture because the UN system has reflected the secular bias of the Western European and North American hegemonic attitudes towards that go all the way back to the colonial era. Because we reflect that attitude in our multilateral systems and we see religion as marginal, we have allowed two things drastically to happen. We have not used the way that religions can be so foundationally important for behavioral change and attitudes. We have ignored that. And two, we have decided that we can use and manipulate and instrumentalize certain religious leaders and certain religious institutions to help serve the purposes that we think we can now be smart enough to use. Religious institutions are as morally bankrupt as political institutions and every other institution. The challenge is how do you engage multiculturally, multilaterally, and simultaneously in order to hold every single institution accountable. Our civil society space is defunct because it doesn't integrate the religious spaces within them. Um, our, our political institutions are defunct because they instrumentalize religious 
spaces when and if they see them and notice them. These, these aspects have to change drastically. We tend to focus on quantity rather than quality. So even within the United Nations system, where there are notable initiatives that engage with religious institutions and religious leaders and faith-based organizations, they seem to think that that's the number that they are engaging that matters. How many do we have as faith-based partners that matters? That is erroneous and deeply problematic. It is the quality of the engagement, and there is only one litmus test for the quality of multilateral, multi-religious engagement, and that is precisely the multi-religious. Religions have to be held accountable, and they know no better than each one of them holding each other accountable and working together. The war that we are seeing today in the Ukrainian context is a war that happens because one religious institution stands behind it. That is wrong. We have to work with all religions together simultaneously and hold them all accountable and make them accountable to the rest of civil society and our multilateral structures. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karam. Incredibly powerful. And, and thank you so much for providing those perspectives and, and clearly identifying where the responsibility of the actors and the responsibility of, of the actors that you pointed to, the religious institutions, political institutions. Really fantastic uh, intervention. Thank you so much. If I can um, now turn to uh, Yulia, please. Yulia, you have the, the floor. Thank you, Corley. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Julia Oliva, and I'm head of policy at UNEP WCMC. And policy at UNEP WCMC is one of our innovation areas, which reflects that in order to address current global challenges, we also have to change and evolve in how we address these challenges. Uh, when asked to speak about fair and effective multilateralism, I recall the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I say this to highlight that the urgency of the global crisis for people and nature doesn't preclude, but actually requires that we seek solutions together through inclusive processes. So multilateralism is fundamental to reaching a healthy planet and prosperity for all. And Stockholm Plus 50 is an opportunity to bring multilateralism to the next level. As we know, the 1972 conference marked the start of a dialogue between countries, which is essential, but not sufficient to address global challenges challenges. Stockholm Plus 50 should prompt a dialogue that is more inclusive, bringing together not only countries, but also cities, civil society, youth, business, and indigenous peoples and local communities. It's really only through such inclusive dialogue that we can together define more ambitious targets, looking not only at the symptoms, but also at the systems that need to fundamentally change. Multilateralism is the only way to identify and address underlying inequities, recognize the rights of those that are most vulnerable and most impacted, and acknowledge approaches that are practical and meaningful on the ground. Now, to be fair and effective, to me, multilateralism needs to be inclusive, and this means uh, a few things. One, international conventions should provide space not only for member states, but also to other stakeholders, not only during the conference of the parties, but also in intersessional work programs. Inter second, international processes should integrate different ways of knowing, such as how IBES currently integrates indigenous and local knowledge in its assessments. Third, Governments should engage with a range of stakeholders in defining ways to develop, put in practice, and monitor commitments and measures taken to implement international conventions. And finally, civil society, business, and other stakeholders need to engage in a constructive and meaningful way so that together we can bring about the change we need. And I still have plenty of time left over. I hope that means I didn't speak too fast, but thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia, for, for those um, clear recommendations. I'm going to, I didn't actually forgot to, to give the list of people that, that will now speak. So um, I have uh, David Rosen um, of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, Catherine Heyer of um, WILP, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So. Uh, David, if you can raise your hand, then I think the technical team can um, find you. Let's just see. Otherwise, if uh, Katrin 
I saw you were active on in the chat earlier if Ketram is is still in the meeting. Many ah, there you are, David. Fabulous. Yes, and then ma many thanks. And thank you so much for the floor, Carly. So my name is Dave Rosen from Sweden. I'm representing the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Systems, International IDEA. So just begin to welcome the key messages and the urgent actions put forward in this uh, leadership dialogue and the discussions ahead of the leadership dialogue. Let me just say on the second key message on effective and fair multilateralism. We believe that, it's, that it is only through inclusive democratic governance institutions that the rights and views of local people, indigenous people and local communities will be heard and channeled into the decision making for the required urgent actions to implement the SDGs. We already see many existing conventions on this, such as the Aarhus and Escas conventions that have already been mentioned. So this is just to underline the importance of such conventions and the implementation of those. Let me just briefly connect to the third key message as well on just transitions, inclusivity and gender equality. We note that responding to these issues inevit inevitably points towards the need to strengthen democratic governance and democratic rights and institutions. Citizen voices and arguments must be heard for societies to collectively debate and agree about what just transition means, what actions are needed to ensure intergenerational equity. We are convinced that strengthening inclusive democratic governance plays a fundamental role for the attainment of a healthy planet through ambitious citizens owned climate action and measures to prevent biodiversity loss. So in conclusion, the recommendation is to include democratic governance and democratic rights as an indispensable way to deal effectively with the climate crisis. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Um... Catherine, please, uh, over to you. Thank you so very much for giving me the floor. Um, it's been really interesting and inspiring to hear from all of um, my colleagues today in the session. So my statement um, relates to both message two and four. Um, I speak on behalf of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF. And um, as mentioned in um, previous sessions, we regret that neither the background paper of um, Leadership Dialogue 1 nor the two background papers from the other Leadership Dialogues include references to peace or references to the devastating impacts of militaries, weapons, and armed conflict and violence on the environmental and climate crisis. And um, I would also say that many of my colleagues have raised these issues in many of the consultations in all Leadership Dialogues and also today. Um, orally and also in the chat. And we feel that the lack of including these topics really is regrettable, um, especially as Ambassador Dion just emphasized as well the very fact that world governments are wasting three times as much money on military spending as they are spending on the climate crisis. And I'm citing um, the ambassador here. And so as we've um, elaborated in previous rounds of consultations, and this was also reinforced by Ambassador Schult of Ecuador in his concluding remarks at the last consultations on the 22nd of April, the role of militaries um, in perpetuating the climate and environmental crisis really cannot be ignored. Militaries are among the most carbon intensive institutions in any state. Military activity directly contributes to environmental degradation through pollution of land, air and water. It is devastating impacts through its greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption, land grabbing, the extraction of rare earth minerals and fossil fuels for use in the arms industry, the development and production of nuclear weapons and much more. And in the spirit of bridging the silos, um, and I believe this could be included in message, messages 204, we think that there should be a recognition of the links between peace and environment. And there are many existing internationally agreed documents um, for example, that include language on military spending as well as armed conflict and how it impacts on sustainable development, including the environment. And this includes um, the UN General Assembly resolutions on disarmament and development, the 1992 Rio Declaration, as well as the, as the paging platform for action. So just to say that there really cannot be a healthy planet um, if we don't have peace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for, for that um, intervention. Um, the final speaker for this round is uh, Susanna Barrier of Public Services International. Oops, sorry, colleagues, one more speaker. Um, uh, Susanna Barrier of, uh, sorry, Public Services International. And then we will go to the next round on human rights. But Susanna, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. I'm here on behalf of Public Services International, that is a global union federation representing uh, workers in quality public, in public services, including in the healthcare sector. The first point I want to make is related to message one, and it's uh, related to the role, the central role of quality public services in mitigation of um, climate change impacts, because we have seen that at the moment that we have um, impacts of climate change, Quality public services, of course, come on the, on the stress, but they are also the first one to be mobilized to respond um, and to provide relief to communities, be it when there are floods, heat waves, pandemics, or earthquakes. And affected communities need that care, health and social care, food support services, housing. But when the public interest is at uh, stake, um, we have seen that the market is not able to respond adequately. It rather contributes to sharpen inequalities and suffering, and that's where public services and quality of public services are required to be of quality. They need to be adequately structured, but also adequately funded. Um, and I just want to highlight um, the, um, um, the, the, the a recent study that highlighted that um, during the pandemic, the mortality and infection rates in nursing homes where there was um, that were unionized were much lower than other facilities. So we very often forget the role of trade unions in actually improving quality of services, and that is to be taken into account. In addition to that, uh, the element of bringing them to the table for any just transition needs to be highlighted. It's been missed in most of the reports of this uh, working group, and, and that's very um, uh, unfortunate. Uh, the final point I want to make is also that we have seen a contradiction during the pandemic of the rules that are human rights rule, the right to health, and the rules of the trade system. And we need to be in, to ensure that doesn't repeat itself with the climate crisis, and that when international rules come in confrontation, uh, international trade rules come in confrontation with human rights, the human rights charter, the UN charter should prevail. And we request that to be also included to ensure that the failure that we have seen on um, lifting intellectual property rights is not repeated for renewable energies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. And that is the perfect segue to the next sec section, actually the next discussion round on um, uh, the implementation of a human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment and all the elements that are that the messages that we've heard around that coming through very strongly in these consultations. So a very, very strong connection, not only between climate and nature, but also justice, um, human rights issues, the social dimension, fair transition. So I'm very pleased to um, then invite the speakers for to introduce this session. First of all, Antonio Benjamin, who is uh, joining us as president of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. Um, Kate Gilmore, um, LSE professor and former UN Deputy High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights, and my colleague from uh, UNEP and Nairobi, um, Andy Rain, who is head of the International Law Unit. But please, Antonia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, sorry. Many thanks for the invitation, Corley, and, and for organizing uh, this the consultation, is particularly on, on law and, and rights, but not just rights, but also obligations. We have uh, to understand that Stock in Stockholm 1972 uh, is the starting point of environmental law globally. And that's a recognition that unfortunately is not uh, widespread uh, and we don't see it repeated very often. Uh, before 1972, we had some countries, including Sweden, uh, enacting environmental legislation, piecemeal uh, legislation, but it was after Stockholm 1972 that the world finally woke up uh, to the need of developing specific environmental law systems, both international, national, and subnational. For Stockholm Plus 50, I believe 
from the perspective of law, but also from the perspective of judges, there are few um, points that I would like to stress. The first is that we moved from 1972 to now through Rio 92, uh, Johannesburg, Rio again. And in this journey, we came to understand that rights and obligations in respect to the environment fit within an umbrella that we call the environment rule of law. And I have not seen the concept of the environment rule of law being um, highlighted in um, the outcome documents that we expect um, we'll see out, uh, from, from Stockholm plus 50. Without the rule of law and without the environment rule of law, we go nowhere. We can make all the speeches we want, but without legal frameworks, we go nowhere. But legal frameworks are not enough. Those legal frameworks need to be well drafted, and it's time to emphasize not just rights, but obligations. So the environment rule of law is not just about rights, but it is about clear and implementable obligations, both individual and collective obligations. But it's especially about implementation. And here is the whole world in which we judges uh, play or don't play uh, the role that the world expect from us. Many times we don't play the role because we don't know that we don't know about this role. Other times we don't play the the role because we are afraid the rule of law is not present. Other times we don't play the role because the law and the adequate law is not there. Be international agreements with no teeth with no direct implementation, be constitutional provisions that are so vague and just statement of um, uh, uh, utopia or be legislations that is badly uh, draft. So my time is over. First, recognize Stockholm 1972 as the foundational moment of international and domestic environmental law. Second, an emphasis on the environmental rule of law. Third, a even bigger emphasis on implementation of both international, national, and subnational agreements. Many thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Antonio. Very, very clear, and um, and also the the different dimensions that we we need to integrate into the recommendations. Thank you so much. Um, over to Kate Gilmore. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, failure to sustain peace and prosperity for people and planet is a high speed driverless vehicle hurtling into the global village square, hitting hardest those with the least, impacting fastest those who've already lost the most, being far worse for those on the wrong side of deepening inequality, for children, for youth, women of the global south, for indigenous people, the marginalised, the poor. Yet, as the Human Rights Council finally affirmed, all have a human right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment. To unlock ambitious, urgent and concrete action, we must one, end false value economics. The holy grail of economic growth falsifies and distorts, discounting full costs of production to people, planet and peace. In its place, we need new paradigms of prosperity for our commonwealth. 360 degree true cost accounting for production, distribution and consumption, which is the gravest threat, not population size. Two, let's construct cons courageous global sovereignty. No state can solve the triple whammy planetary crisis on its own, while single state inaction impacts far beyond borders. So center a sustainable world order on the earth with its multiple species as the sovereign state, the sovereign territory of the state of humanity, the sovereign territory of the state of humanity now and for future generations. Elevate 
multi-state cooperation to the top border in statecraft and construct future loyal, legally binding cooperation mechanisms to serve the intergenerational human family of rights holders on a planetary scale across temporal borders. Three, make global decision-making tables inclusive. Women, youth, human rights and environmental defenders, consumer association, global influences and industry must not be left on the sidelines. States' leadership is essential, but its hierarchies, its pomp and protocols must not divert action or stifle accountability. Technical and community experts must be free to inform without political inf interference or intimidation. And stop decision-making tables bartering away the, about the what and why of these crises. Get real about the how and who. Where victims of the climate, where victim of the climate catastrophe, address how they'll be respected, protected, and remedied. Where actors are at fault, address how they'll be held accountable. Where actors are essential, address how they will be engaged and made free, and where appropriate, obliged to act. And that means tackle corruption at source. This feign ignorant, self interested, short sighted actors through greed and false dealings who are spoiling our progress. Profiteers of unsustainable production have campaigned for doubt and misinformation. Fossil fuel barons in particular have sought to do to climate science what tobacco giants did when medicine first warned against smoking, eroding reason, fact, and thus public trust. So tackle the opponents of sustainability, for that is what they are. End the impunity they and their enablers enjoy. Stop cajoling business that pollutes and destroys and put real teeth into such as the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Friends, in it all, civil society is our greatest renewable resource. But the ongoing onslaught of environmental and indigenous, the ongoing slaughter of environmental and indigenous defenders are clarion signs that that essential resource of civil society too is under gravest threat. Draconian legislation, intimidation, crackdowns on freedoms of assembly and association are criminally counterproductive to sustainable climate action. Friends, the climate for climate change action too must change. Thank you. Fantastic, Kate. That really gave us uh, the, the energy and the enthusiasm. Fantastic intervention. Thank you so much. And coming back to, to the how and the who, that is exactly what we're looking for for the recommendations going into the international meeting in two weeks time. Uh, next over to Andy, Andrew Rain, please, from UNIP. And uh, Andy, we have slightly put you on the spot there in terms of the energy levels following Kate. So please give it your best go. Many, many, many thanks, Corley. Um, allow me to get straight to the point on the recommendations around fulfilling the human right to an environment. Three key points. First, it's time to make this right a reality. So the recommendations must emphasize this implementation focus. They can encourage governments and other actors, businesses, civil society to apply the right, to comply with it, to enforce it, to implement it. And in this context, I can't agree more with Justice Antonio Benjamin on the opportunity of environmental rule of law being hardwired as the tool to get us there. Two, to states, whilst implementation should be a focus, we still need to elevate legal recognition of the right to a healthy environment. At the national level, 156 states to be precise have it already, but there are still those states, large jurisdictions that don't have it, and they should be encouraged to follow in this journey. At the international level, there are specific entry points that the international community can take. One, the General Assembly has an opportunity to now follow the uh, Human Rights Council and adopt a resolution on the right to universalize that recognition and other entry points, such as the Global Biodiversity Framework. And three, the recommendations can speak to the need to governments and businesses to do more to protect environmental human rights defenders. Defenders need their own recommendation, and we need to reframe how we think about defenders. They're not victims. They shouldn't be victims. They are critical partners in this implementation of environmental law. 
And then finally, two quick points on intergenerational equity, because this needs to be hard woven into the recommendations. And here I offer two points. First, the recommendations can help advance some of the core proposals in our common agenda report, uh, relevant to duties to the future, strategic foresight, solidarity to succeeding generations. And there are some exciting proposals in there, the Declaration on Future Generations, the Summit of the Future, and others. And second, it can also take forward some of the key related messages that have been developed under various processes, not in, you know, just to name one, the high level committee on programs that came up with two core recommendations on this point. First, encourage states and other stakeholders to build a scientifically backed empirical basis for our understanding of the impact of today's actions on multiple generations both current and unborn. For example, promoting systemic adoption of approaches such as future impact assessments, development of indicators on intergenerational equity, and so on and so forth. And then finally, a normative and legal push in this space. States need to be encouraged to strengthen their frameworks on intergenerational equity, as well as encouraging good practices in this regard. So, Corley, um, many, many thanks to you and to, to everyone in this discussion. Over. Thank you very much, Andy, for, for uh, joining the conversation and for providing those recommendations. And it's coming through in, in so many dimensions and, and areas. The, the way our institutions are working at the moment is really not fit for purpose. And all by business as usual and going forward we can't really work with business as usual so they are key sort of performance institutional norms uh, framing issues away basically the institutions of the day are supporting unsustainability or the degradation of nature and that is that is the change that we need to think through as well um, in terms of additional speakers that i would like to call on um, for this round i have my Schult from End Ecoside in uh, Sweden, Iria Fulgera Castro of Protection International, Agnes Imgard, Parents for Future Global, and Joko Lu of the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force, and Natalia Gomez of Earth Rights International, Colombia. So, can I ask my please, my Schult, if you can um, start? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. So my proposal for concrete action goes well with what justice, the justice said recently, we need the rule of law. What we are doing is not working. And it turns out that even human rights, you would think somebody was talking earlier about the balance between human rights and rights of nature or the rights of, of the environment and what should we protect first. Well, it turns out there will be a report published very soon by the Asser Institute in The Hague, which shows quite clearly that human rights law as it stands today is insufficient to protect human rights. There was a recent, uh, in October 2021, the UN came out with a declaration of a new right, a human right to a healthy and clean environment. The human rights law today is soft law. It does not enable us to hold people to account. We have the guidelines, we have recommendations, but we cannot hold people to account. And a small number of people are ruining the planet for us all. So we need to make ecocide a crime on the same level as crimes against humanity and genocide. And it's perfectly possible. It's a practical step, it's a possible step, and it's a really powerful step in the right direction because it also affects our values. And actually, it's not possible to re reach the sustainable development goals. We can't protect human rights. We cannot even mitigate climate change if we don't protect nature. And this is the, 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 a senior lawyer from whose long experience in both environmental law and human rights law in, uh, from the court in Brussels, sorry, in Luxembourg, says that there's a tool missing in the environmental in lawyer's toolbox. And that tool, tool is the top level crime, ecocide and the Rome Statute. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mike, for, for that contribution. Um, Ilya, fantastic. Thank you very much for switching on your camera. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, really, thank you for these opportunities. It's really, is a pleasure. For Protection International, uh, for us, it seems quite obvious that safeguarding the right to life, liberty, security of people who defend the human right to a healthy environment, and that protecting them against such harassment, intimidation, criminalization, and attacks should stay a top priority to address when discussing about an urgent need for action to achieve a healthy planet. So to address this urgent problem uh, of the the killings and harassment against environmental defenders, we propose first that the, it is the state and not the defenders, uh, which of course, as the, the colleague was saying, are not the victims, to, are not to be uh, uh, portrayed as victims, but uh, it's also not their, their obligation, but the state to, to uh, reduce the risk that they may face. So for that, it's highly recommended to carry us to carry out risk analysis and protection plans that should be non-discriminatory, gendered, intersectional, and psychosocially uh, framed. Okay, uh, apart from that, we think that for planning, developing, and implementing the risk analysis and protection plans for environmental defenders, uh, public policies mu must be clearly established and the appropriate resources, both in budget and specialized personnel, have to be available for, for, for that. Uh, since the first law aiming at protecting the, this right to, ref to defend human and environmental rights was post was passed in Colombia 25 years ago, there has been a, num a growing number of countries that have a public policy in place. But only 30 of these 38, 38 countries have talked about such a policy, only 14, uh, which is quite a small percentage within the UN member states, only 14 have already en enacted an actual policy for, pro for protection. Uh, besides, we don't have yet a comprehensive analysis or understanding about the efficiency and the impact of these policies, which we think is key for achieving sustainable state-promoted protection systems for environmental defenders. Thank you very much. Yeah, oops, thank you very much yeah, for, for your contribution. Uh, next on the list is Agnes Emgard, please. Um, I don't see Agnes. Um, otherwise, shall we go to uh, Yoko Lu, please? You have the floor, Yoko. So dear Madam Chair, my name is Yoko Ru. I am from Canada and Japan, representing the Stockholm Past 50 Years Task Force. In addition to climate crisis, the global COVID-19 pandemic has posed new threats to the world, and we are facing with economic and social uncertainty for both the present and future. Poverty inequalities and security will be re-examined when the decision-making process is conveyed multilaterally. South and South and Changri cooperation are important in showing meaningful engagement through knowledge exchange, capacity building, and technical assistance among the developed and Global South countries to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. This process also helps countries accelerate transition to a green economy and achieve climate resilience more effectively and quickly. Adaptive technology innovation is one example that can enhance this process and to address adaptation and mitigation process. Investment portfolio needs to be decarbonized and encourage financial institutions, corporations, civil society organizations, and individuals to mount pressure on their governments in delivering on the pledges to prioritize climate resilient development in national budgets. Countries need to report their progress in the sectors of channeling financial flows to the enactment and enforcement of climate resilient fiscal policies aiming at decarbonizing economies on a national and in the medium term and a global level. There needs to be an absolute degree of agreement among parties so that public finance will be enough Announcement by the European Investment Bank has declared that doubling 50% of share of sustainable financing is not sufficient. Therefore, investment from private sector is needed. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you so much, Yoko. Very specific in terms of some of those recommendations in terms of uh, national budgets and, and planning instruments, but also reference to the parties to the various conventions and the role of private finance. Thank you very much. Agnes, thank you for joining us. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking for Parents for Future Global and I'm situated in the Global North in Germany, but we are an international network of parents of grassroots, parent climate activists situated on all, country, on all continents. So thank you very much for giving the voice uh, to the parents. We see ourselves as speaking for the small children, the unborn children and the future generations, because we think when that intergenerational equity really needs to be taken more into consideration. When we are talking about um, the vision of a healthy planet and the prosperity for all, we really need to acknowledge that the prosperity we enjoy now, especially the privileged in the global north, is based on the exploitation of the people and the planet. But most of all, we live on the costs of the future generations. We use their resources and we use their carbon budget and we, to be honest, destroy biodiversity now um, and which can't be restored. So the question is, what are we leaving behind? The comfortable lives we are enjoying now, we live, we sacrifice the future of our children. Um, and we think this is a very, very uncomfortable truth that many don't want to hear. And uh, we think that we really need to face this uncomfortable truth. When we're talking about the rights to a healthy environment, uh, that means the health, uh, the rights for a healthy environment for all children. Even now, 93% of all children um, breathe toxic air. The climate crisis is a child right crisis, as UNICEF rightly says. And uh, parents are not aware that their children that are born now will face droughts, floods, crop shortages, and floods. So um, I think it's really very, very important that we think more of future generations and really take their rights into account. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes, for that contribution. Um, and very, very pertinent points, thinking about how do we have those longer term perspectives on, on planning, but also looking at the regenerative capacity of, of nature and how we make provision for future generations. Thank you so much for that intervention. The final speaker for this round is Natalia Gomez of Earth Rights International. And then we will go to the, the final discussion round on integrated approaches. Uh, Natalia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I, I don't think we can speak about an effective implementation of the right to a healthy environment and real climate action when around the world environmental human rights defenders are increasingly targeted with violence, harassment, and criminalization. I'm from Colombia, a country where everyday defenders pay with their lives the price to defend the environment. This context of violence and repression around the world is especially true for indigenous defenders, including women. Most climate damaging projects are located in indigenous lands or cross through indigenous territories, where the pattern of failures in the consultation processes, repression and silencing of opposition movements continues and endangers the lives and livelihoods of already vulnerable populations. As the climate crisis worsens, so does the violence against those that are protecting our environment. At the international level, international multilateral environmental agreements have already started to recognize the role of environmental defenders. That is true for the Escazú Agreement in my region in Latin America, adopted in 2018 as the first treaty to address this issue. Uh, but also it's true in Europe, where parties of the Aarhus Convention adopted last year a decision on environmental defenders. Yet, at the global level, when states are negotiating their climate commitments, there has been no recognition of the situation of, and the situation of violence and the role of environmental defenders in effective climate action. So we, we really think that the states should follow these precedents and, for, and recognize the role of environmental defenders and the importance of their work in the context of the climate crisis. 
states should commit to guarantee an enable environment for environmental defenders and to ensure the protection of the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association, access to information and participation as essential to effective climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia, for emphasizing the, that um, the role of environmental uh, defenders and the protection. And, and as Andy also said, not to, to only view them as, as victims, but really as for the in incredibly important role they do to defend the environment, to defend people's rights in terms of their access to environment. So th thank you so much for, for highlighting that again. This is the, then the conclusion of this round of the discussion, and I would like to, to go then move over to the, the um, fourth message that is coming from the consultations. And if my colleagues could put the slide on the screen. So this is all about the teamwork that uh, Special Envoy Dion referred to, the integrated and joint approaches, um, linking issues, but also looking at those really systemic systems levers that we, you know, can we address sustainable consumption and production that is actually contributing to so many other things? Can we um, move forward on inclusive and fair transformations of the economy. What are our options here? Who should lead? Who should do what? Um, who should play along and who should lead the charge? So I am very, very pleased here yeah, to invite as our first speaker, Olobenga Olobanjo, who is an Earthshot Prize uh, finalist for 2021 and founder and CEO of Ready. And then after Olu, I'm going to invite Patricia Morales, who is Environmental Social Risk Analysis and Policy Division of the Banco de Mexico. And then uh, third speaker in this round is Christina Romanelli, our Biodiversity and Climate Change Expert of the World Health Organization. And then um, I will give the, the list for uh, the additional round of speakers shortly after that. But first, Olio, thank you so much for your patience. You joined right from the start and you've had a lot of uh, different perspectives and contributions. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for that introduction, um, Olio. Um, I, I'm coming from the lens of the private sector where um, my name is Olivia Gaul um, and I'm a founder of Ready Like uh, Michael also introduced. So I'm coming from the lens of um, what we do, what we do at Ready and specifically um, how we see the world um, coming from um, developing nations. So at Ready, um, our goal is to accelerate um, the adoption of clean technologies in the energy politics of the world. Um, and we are doing that currently, we are doing that currently in Nigeria, I'm in Nigeria now. And uh, what we are trying to do is to, um, is to see how individuals that are left out of the energy, um, that are left, individuals that have like, energy poverty now could actually have access to energy. Um, it's very important to state that um, Right now, globally, we have over 600 million people, um, Africans specifically, without access to electricity. And um, electric, uh, we have another 300 million that connected to the grid when we struggle with live electricity. Um, as far as that is a concern, um, another big issue that it's very important to mention is that electricity itself is fundamental to all human development opportunities. What that means is that without electricity, anything can be done. But what we've seen, um, what, what, what the approach that we've seen that we that we, what we've seen by individuals and, and, and businesses in African communities is that they have to go through the very, very expensive and hazardous means to like generate their own civil electricity. And because of that, that's um, that has caused both um social, environmental, and even economical problems to these people. Right now, we have states in Nigeria where um we are they are very polluting, they are very polluting um. I'm very hazardous um, here, um, and that's this because of continuous use of fossil fuels, um, continuous use of, um, of firewood, continuous use of all these very all these very harmful resources that these guys have to use to generate electricity. Our goal at Ready is to change this narrative by providing electricity that is very, very affordable, easy to use, and adaptable to these people's lives. So that's what we are trying to do. That's what we are trying. That's what we are doing in, in, in Ready, and we are trying to also integrate it into the climate action. Like our systems now um, offset more than one sixty kilogram of CO two when an individual uses the system, and because of that, we are able to. We are kind of taking people from instead of using that new generator that is expensive and hazardous, you can actually explore more clean energy means. But one of the challenges that we've seen with this adoption is that 
um, capital has been a big challenge, especially when it comes to like the global south, innovation in the global south, where um, there's a lot of political instability, there's currency crisis, so there's been like less um, capital flow into that space, especially around um, around like clean technologies and climate um, climate tech projects in that space. And and there's also and we should we should also know that the guys in this region, like especially Africa and Southeast Asia, they may, they are going to be the ones to feel the climate crisis the most. Like Nigeria now is kind of quite odd. There are places where drought is happening, famine is happening, and these guys are already they already are, they already struggle with limited resources. And the the way it's going now with the climate um, with the with the climate crisis coming up, they are going to be the highest receiver of some of the biggest challenge, the climate challenge that the world is going to face. Um, although they are not even they are not not most of the time the largest polluter, but they are going to be the ones to face the challenge. So uh, what we are trying to do already is to dry our own best to include everybody into that opportunity where we are able to like provide electricity and the price of providing electricity bring opportunities to people. And with that opportunity comes developmental opportunities both locally and globally, and people are also are able to like assess opportunities because, like I said. Without energy, anything is impossible. A majority of things are impossible. We won't be able to talk today if there's no energy. Like I had, I had energy on my phone. I had energy where I am. The light up everywhere. So, but we still have 600 million people in Africa alone, and um, globally, roughly a billion people that still struggle with electricity. So that's uh, that's my message here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, and thank you for for providing the messages around both scale but also technologies and, and how we can use make best use of, of new technologies to maybe <clears throat> change the way that our traditional systems have, have thought about or provided and delivered energy. Um, a great example. Thank you so much for, for that contribution, Alu. Um, next over to Patricia, please. Good morning. Well, on my side of the world, good morning yes, good to morning. you all. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. So I work in a central bank, Central Bank of Mexico. Uh, we have been um, studying and looking into, into climate and biodiversity, biodiversity risk for already three years. And um, as central banks, we've reached the following conclusion. We have two serious structural problems facing our economies. The first one was what brought central banks to, to, to this agenda is the risk on financial stability. Um, we, we were part of the, the, the founding members of the Network for the Greening of the Financial System in to, and at the end of 2017, uh, concerned about the potential risks of climate change in financial systems. And the reason this network was created is because we were very concerned on the consequences of not knowing how to integrate climate related risks originally into financial decision making. This, the, the lack of understanding of these risks when you make financial decisions that look into the future can generate serious, serious um, problems to financial stability. And this was, a, this was a concern of originally eight central banks and supervisors. We are now 120 and we've been working and developing the tools to understand better the risks of financial stability. And more recently, the main concern of central banks now, as you know, is inflation. And it, there is a clear link on inflation and ecosystem degradation as well as climate change. We have a clear understanding now on the impacts that we can have on, uh, on inflation because of several supply, what we call in uh, the economy is called supply shocks. So it's reduction of supply because of reduction in productivity, agricultural productivity, reduction uh, in supply chains because of uh, extreme weather events that destroy our supply chains, and also uh, consequences of not managing uh, correctly and smoothly uh, a transition to renewable and, and, and clean energies and low carbon economies. Uh, a bad, a bad uh, policy environment can cause uh, serious troubles, uh, serious problems in terms of controlling the price system. So now central banks, we are extremely concerned on what, how, how we can contribute and contributing to, to reducing inflation cannot be reduced to increasing interest rates. It has, to, it has to do with looking into policy. We have serious market failures. We cannot simply say increasing carbon taxes will, will uh, 
um, solve the problem. So looking into our agenda very quickly, we're looking in at our level in the financial system, making sure that we are uh, pushing forward the agenda to increase disclosures, that we have a clear understanding of the impacts that companies are having. And I think we should push this further. It's going at a certain speed, but we can push it further to have greater transparency of the impacts of companies on, on, the, on the environment and their dependencies on biodiversity. We are developing the tools and we need to go faster to do forward-looking analysis of this, of this uh, risk. This involves having to understand scenario analysis, which is a tricky and, 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 and really sophisticated uh, tool, but we need to get financial institutions and companies uh, better equipped to do their analysis, to understand the implications of what's going to, going to happen in the future on the several uh, on the several scenarios. And then the, the last item on the agenda that we're pushing uh, is the agenda of mobilizing finance towards uh, the proper investments, the investments that have less risk and the investments that can push uh, the transformation uh, in a way that is not too, dis too um, aggressive into financial into the financial system otherwise we will have a series of financial crises we will have inflation and the transition will be less than smooth it will be really distortive so this is the agenda that we're pushing in our countries and evidently mexico is a central bank in a, in a very high risk environment so i hope that we can go faster uh, so that's what i have to say for now Muchas gracias, Patricia. That was that's great, and and I think Mexico, the central bank's leadership, and this is is really recognised. And you've been involved, as you say, for a very long time, and that sort of the the watershed moment, all that understanding, the shift to the dependency of of economic systems and and financial systems on environment, I think, is something that um, could be picked up. Um, maybe in, in some of the recommendations, but thank you for clearly identifying central banks also as, as very important actors in contributing to this transformation and, and driving investment or providing the regulatory frameworks also um, for this transformation. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go to you, Christina, I just want to uh, say who I will call on in the next session, just so that people can, can get ready. So I have Mona Mason of Estagat of the Danish Ministry of Environment, Ebony Holland of the um, International Institute for Environment and Develop Development, it's a Elizabeth Seidel of UNODC, Rob Wheeler, uh, Eco Village Network, uh, Gunn, Rutquist of Stockholm University, Baltic Sea Centre, and Alex Rafalovich of the Fossil Field Treaty. Um, so that's a lot of hands to be raised and identified. So in the meantime, Christina, the uh, floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. It really is such an honor to join you on behalf of WHO at the margins of the preparatory meeting for the 2023 Prince Mahidol uh, Award Conference, which for those that don't know is a prestigious sort of annual gathering that recognizes outstanding achievements in medicine and public health. And why am I telling you this? Because you are the first to know that for PMAC 2023, we've adopted climate, biodiversity, pollution, and health as the core theme, demonstrating, I think, a real shift and aperture from the global and public health community to work across sectors to tackle those common challenges that we face. So to maximize time, I'd like to tackle a few key issues that I think head on to bring in, you know, that crucial health perspective into the fold and present you with 10 core recommendations to guide evidence-based action and oriented uh, and, and act oriented, if you will, uh, decision making that I think could really contribute to generating the required enabling environment, if you will, to move us collectively toward our collective sustainable development goals at the at the nexus of this triple crisis. So without hesitation, uh, I'll begin by saying as a very first pillar, we as a society, I believe really need to commit to a healthy green and just recovery from COVID-19, drawing on the six pillars that were outlined in the WHO manifesto for a healthy and green recovery that was launched in 2020. The first pillar of which recognizes nature as the foundation of health and then harnessing those opportunities, um, of sustainable development through restoration that eco you know that ecosystem restoration can provide to create 
health promoting environments in ways that prevent future health threats to both people and planet in a much more coordinated, holistic and inclusive manner, premised on uh, the recognition that bridging the crises we face in present and those that we'll face in future really demand a cross-sectoral, multilateral, multidisciplinary efforts across Level, levels of governance um, and society through integrated approaches such as One Health and planetary health. Second, make abundantly clear that our health is absolutely not negotiable. With COVID-19 and other health crises that have preceded it, I think we all know and we're reminded every single day of the scale of the damage done when environmental concerns are treated as separate to socioeconomic and health considerations. So placing health and social justice at the heart of Stockholm Plus 50 discussions and recommendations uh, and those that will also arise from, you know, COP27, uh, the UNFCCC's COP27 and COP15 on biodiversity, I think will really be instrumental to ensuring bolder, more equitable distribution of costs and benefits. Three, harnessing the potential uh, health benefits of climate and biodiversity actions by prioritizing those interventions with the largest health, social, and economic gains. Four, building health resilience to climate and envir environmental risks by building um, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable health systems and facilities while supporting health adaptation and resilience across sectors. Um, let me just mention that energy systems need to be improved to consider uh, climate and health. We also need to reimagine urban environments, transport and mobility, um, and really making the health community a central partner in this endeavor moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, and thank you for, for the breaking news and, and for for shedding the light on on the many connections and you know as you speak i thought oh my word you really have your your work um cut out for you so many different connections and um you know this comes back to the notion that it's not up to the who alone or not up to to the health system alone to think about these connections but really for society to work together and to prioritize the health of, of people and the health of nature and to make sure that we understand those connections. Um, so if I can go to the list of speakers that uh, I called on, um, a slightly different order is being given to me at the moment. So Ebony Holland of IID and then Elizabeth Seidel and Mona, please. Ebony, why don't you go ahead, please? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak on this important topic of integrated approaches. My name is Ebony Holland with the International Institute for Environment and Development. I want to use my two minutes to stress something simple but very important, that one of the marks of success for Stockholm Plus 50 will be the extent to which it raises the political ambition and commitment for locally led action. This is where decision making power, financial flows and resources are transferred to the local level to get behind the priorities of Indigenous peoples, local communities and other local actors. This is really critical for evolving the sustainable agenda through this next phase and, and really needs to be a focus for integrated and joint approaches. Picking up on some of the common threads already put forward today, particularly around recognising the rights and roles of those most impacted by climate change and the loss of nature, the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting and conclusions text can advance this issue of locally led action in four ways. The first is recognising the critical role of locally led action in achieving sustainable development outcomes for people, nature and climate. The second is recognising that Indigenous peoples and local communities must be part of local, national and global decision making processes. The third is acknowledging the need to get agency over finance and decision making to the local level behind local priorities. And the fourth is rec recommending leaders endorse and implement the principles for locally led adaptation as part of this process. Linked to all of this is, of course, the need for the finance system to change to enable this. There needs to be more finance available to get behind locally-led locally action, 
better access to the finance and the ability to transparently track where that finance is flowing. And so Stockholm plus 50 plus, of course, COP27 and COP15 must progress these issues and ensure governments, multilateral development banks, global funds and intermediaries shift to a new approach, a business unusual, if you will, to support locally led action for people, nature and climate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ebony, and thank you also for reiterating again the connections to the existing multilateral processes where the, the agreements, of course, will be negotiated and helping us to, to articulate those also to make sure that we bring that into the conversation. And next is Elizabeth, please, and then Mona. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the floor and hello to everyone. My name is Lisa, it is Beth, and I work for the Environment Team at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. It's a real pleasure to join the working group today, although of course I understand that UNODC might not be a, a regular on, in, in those discussions. It feels very far removed what we're doing compared to uh, the preparations for Stockholm Plus 50. But I think it's, it's a really good opportunity for me to speak at this point in time because I really want to stress, just as some of the previous speakers did as well, that for us, uh, multilateralism and integrated approaches are going to be ever more crucial to address all the key challenges and threats that contribute to climate change, but also biodiversity loss and pollution. And at UNODC, we're obviously looking at a very specific side of the threats to our environment, but I think that there's great merit in broadening our efforts to choose a more holistic approach to, to our measures. And I think that Stockholm Plus 50 and in particular Leadership Dialogue 1 uh, provides an opportunity for us to really highlight the need to address crimes that affect the environment and also to uh, reflect on how the tools of criminal justice systems can contribute to our collective efforts to achieve a healthier planet and prosperity for all. And uh, UNODC very specifically recommends including action against crimes that affect the environment as one of the priorities for advancing the fulfillment of the human right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment, of course. Uh, this includes for us ensuring effective, proportionate and dissuasive legal frameworks, but also strengthening national and international criminal justice efforts and fostering effective cooperation and uh, preventing corruption. We've had some, some interesting points on, on corruption before. Um, I think by improving how member states address the most serious environmental offenses, the international community as a whole can be more effectively uh, tackling the climate crisis, the environmental degradation and pollution, and as such then increase our accountability and the accountability of all actors causing such environmental harms. So really I'm just, it, this is more of a plea to uh, to maybe widen our, our view of, of what we're looking at and to include uh, environmental crimes as, as a key topic in the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and, and that really relates back to the, the first intervention also around rule of law that uh, from Justice Antonio, that is such an important component of getting all actors to, to work towards uh, the same objectives. Um, next, I have Mona Mason Westerhardt um, and then Alex Rafalovich, oh, but I don't see. Any of them switching on the cameras at this stage, but I do see Gun Rutquist. So why don't you go ahead, Gun? Thank you. I thought my camera was on, but it doesn't seem to be. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'm trying to start the video. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for giving me the floor. Yes, I'm Mona Vestergaard and I am uh, from the Ministry of Environment working with international issues. Uh, I'm also the UNEP coordinator and, and work with uh, several uh, international agreements. Um, I would like to raise uh, the issue of the importance of uh, sustainable consumption and production and circular economy uh, for, for future prosperity and for addressing the, the three planetary crises. Um, we all know that SDG 12 on SCP is, is one of those lagging uh, furthest behind, and there is really a need to, to enhance efforts uh, in, in this area. And uh, this also includes to follow up on the uh, commitments already made in, in the areas. 
for example, on, on fossil fuels. Um, and there are, of course, many ways to go uh, about it. But one of the things we also uh, agreed on a definition on at UNIF 5.2 was uh, a nature based solution, and that this is a key issue if, if we want to to move forward on the uh, on climate as well as nature so that the solutions uh, used to solve one problem doesn't uh, negatively impact the other um, so the question is also how can we promote sustainable consumption and production in general uh, one idea could be for the General Assembly to establish um, a dialogue within EGOSOC or, or a forum to accelerate uh, how we move forward and to, to actually have these uh, measures implemented. And this is, of course, very much an issue also of economic instruments and, and incentives in general, how you incentivize the, the private sector, the financial sector, to behave in a more environment-friendly uh, way. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very, very practical um, recommendation. Um, I do see Alex on the screen. So Alex, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to the chairs and previous presenters. Um, I think that the, the issue of fossil fuels specifically uh, needs to be mentioned and addressed in the Stockholm 50 outcomes. Fossil fuels are, of course, the biggest driver of climate change, uh, but they also contribute to biodiversity loss directly and indirectly uh, via climate change, uh, and then also to the pollutions and plastics crisis. Uh, so I would really strongly recommend a, a clear message from Stockholm Plus 50 on this. Uh, one um, point to make is we recognize that Stockholm Plus 50 is not going uh, to make concrete new obligations on states, but make recommendations. And here is a clear recommendation that Stockholm Plus 50 could make, which is to launch a global commission on the question of the fossil fuel system. That global commission could help serve to build the evidence base around the ways in which the fossil fuel system is driving these crises and look for the solutions. Some of those solutions will be existing in the recommendations uh, coming out of Stockholm Plus 50, realigning financial incentives, looking at the structure of the financial system, uh, implementing stronger legal protections, recognizing indigenous people's rights. And some of them may not yet be in those recommendations. However, Stockholm Plus 50 could light the path for the next decade because the biggest question that we face this decade as humanity is a question on how are we going to shift off fossil fuels justly? This week, a new report came out that showed not only what the IEA has said, that there can be no new fossil fuel production in a 1.5 degree world, no new fields of extraction, but that actually we need to reduce existing producing fields by 40%. So this is a huge task, one that Stockholm is not going to solve, but it could clearly recommend that the world focuses its attention on this by establishing a global commission on fossil fuels. Thank you. Very clear, very practical. Thank you very much. Um, next on the speaker list is Gun Rundquist and then Rob, please. And then we'll wrap up, the co-chairs will wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. I work as head of policy at the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Centre. And I thank you all colleagues also for so many interesting and important issues being brought up. I'd like to complement with two issues that I think has been lacking from today's agenda. First is actually the role of science and the role of science in bridging the gap between science and policymakers. And I urge on society to fund universities, not only to do science, but also to bridge. And that means in reality, funding people yeah. with policy backgrounds, stepping in, helping out and contributing to bridging this gap. That's the first sort of issue I'd like to bring up. And second, being the Baltic Sea Center, we would like also to highlight the importance of coastal areas in relation to the marine areas role in climate change. Um, we are, I think, at a crossroad, whether or not it will be possible to actually combat climate change. And the coastal areas will be key areas for this work. 
it could either end up being really crucial areas for uh, storing and sequestering large amounts of carbon, even larger amounts than terrestrial forests, but mistreated and uh, destroyed ecosystems will eventually end up in being methane leakage bombs. So uh, I urge also Stockholm Plus 50 to highlight the importance of linking climate issues to marine issues. I think that's an important action. And then uh, thirdly, and finally, my third point would be to strongly support a previous speaker touching upon implementation of existing legislation. I would say that that's the starting point and that's the most impo important thing to do because there's tons of nice legislation, but too little implementation. Thank you and welcome all to Stockholm. Wonderful, thank you very much. And thank you for, for the invitation, the kind invitation and great contribution. And then um, Rob, please, you're the last on the list for, for today. Thank uh, you. Discussion rounds. I represent the Global Eco Village Network at the UN. Uh, two things. First, if we're going to take sufficient action to address these interlinking challenges, it is imperative that we include local communities, particularly in the developing world. We need the specific means and vehicles to support the scaling up and replicating of best practices and to invest in integrated community-based approaches to transition to sustainable and regenerative development across all sectors and communities of all sizes. Professor Maury Albertson, who designed the initial US Peace Corps program, suggested creating a global network of locally based bioregional resource and service centers and training programs to support local communities in transitioning to sustainable development. Each center could work with maybe 20 to 50 local villages and towns, and the global network could provide a means to share best practices all around the world, as well as at a bioregional level. The second thing is so many excellent recommendations and observations have been made today and throughout the Stockholm Plus 50 process, addressing such things as ecocide, bridging the silos, corporate accountability, rice beach approaches to addressing global challenges and so much more. We need now a means to follow up on these recommendations and to ensure that the implementation is carried out in a fully integrated manner that is sufficient to address all of the crises that we face and that were mentioned today. During the UNIP plus 50 process, civil society put forward a call for all governments to support and work together to develop and implement a global framework on strengthening environmental legislation and law. Such a global framework would include targets, indicators, goals, a review and follow-up process, a multi-stakeholder initiative where all of the ideas that we've shared could be followed up on and brought together and included as a part of a global framework integrating all aspects of sustainable and environmental development and the need to move forward in a fully integrated manner to address the triple crisis and all of the other emergencies that we're facing today. Thank you for your considerations. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rob, for, for those uh, words. And um, yeah, there's, there's definitely something that we need to reflect on between sort of translating commitments into action, the drive for implementation. Um, but I think we also heard very uh, helpful and, and very sort of clear recommendations today around accountability, around obligations, but most importantly about culture and, and, and values and, and how we connect and how we work together um, in terms of addressing these societal challenges. So thank you very much for everyone for your contributions, for your interventions, for taking the time. I really appreciate that you take the time to prepare statements, to prepare your interventions, go through the registration process, set your time aside. And then fabulous contributions in the in the chat also. So a big, big thank you for everyone, not only for, for today, but also in the, the whole run up over the last uh, couple of months for contributing to this informal working group of the leadership dialogue. So with that, this is the end, my friends, um, for the informal working group stream. But I'm going to hand back to the coaches for their views and, and key 
uh, takeaways. And if I could give the floor first to Special Envoy Dion, please, to Ambassador Dion. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, I will uh, resist uh, to try to sum up the excellent uh, recommendations we have heard to be too long. Just want to say that we are between already convinced people. But there are a lot of people that were not watching us today, and we need to keep them on board. And it will not be necessarily easy. I will give you one example. It is, uh, many of us has mentioned the need to um, end the era of fossil fuels. The problem is that when we started to tackle the uh, crisis of climate change in 1990, uh, fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal, were about 87% of the source of energy of the, uh, for human beings. Today, it's around 82%. So we almost did not make progress. Uh, and so to end that uh, overnight, we would lose the people. Uh, they would vote then for uh, climato-skeptic uh, parties uh, and would do even less than what we are doing now. That's a big challenge. The other challenge uh, has been mentioned, uh, I mentioned it in my introductory remarks, and some of us did it, especially Madame Catherine uh, Gueyer, when she said in our, uh, in our recommendations, we need to have something about conflicts and peace. Uh, indeed, it's true. Uh, I have the, uh, the data in the document uh, uh, that I publish. Is the, the title is uh, um, the, uh, the, the Global Impact of Putin's War. Uh, it's true that before this war, uh, a third of uh, our, uh, in fact, we were spending three times more uh, on military spending than on fighting climate change. Three times more, I give the exact numbers in this paper. That's a tragedy. But another tragedy of war is that it's destroying also the environment in, in addition to destroying, uh, destroying the people. Uh, and and other, uh tragedy is that is increasing the cost of energy as the, the war in Ukraine is doing. So natural gas is more costly. It may be a good news, natural gas being a fossil fuel, but guess what? People then will buy more coal, will use more coal because coal will become more competitive and coal is two times more polluting than natural gas. So these wars are awful for, for human beings, but awful for our relationship with the planet. We need to address that. So I stop here, but you see how much it will be key to keep the people with us. Thank you very much. Super important message. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Dion. But uh, the last word, closing the session, up to you. over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corley, and thank you, uh, most importantly, to all, all the, the participants uh, for all these this so important contributions, not only in their interventions, but also on the messages that they put through the chat box, the reports. There is a, a, a large amount of material that uh, is uh, from one side encouraging, but also uh, obliging us or, or with the responsibility to read and go through all these documents before Stockholm to be even more prepared uh, when we arrive to, to that conference. Uh, I uh, also don't want to, to summarize uh, all those, those important contributions, but I cannot resist to, to address or refer to some of them. Uh, very, very important ones, the link or need to, to, to link um, nature, uh, climate action with nature action. Uh, we have very, very strong and, and the messages in that regard and to, to bring together those those agendas and i will speak with that that's also talk to the to the need for a synergy between the different uh, environmental multilateral agreements we i just came from from um, cop 15 uh, that is still going on and on unccd in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and, and it's amazing how important and how the same people that are uh, doing certain actions in, on the climate agenda um, should be doing the same and, and connecting with with what is going on on the certification which among the three real conventions uh, has, been, has been a little bit left behind not only in terms of implementation but even in the political attention that is needed uh, for 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 the achievement of their objectives this is just an example uh, also in, in such a strong strong points about a uh, rights approach and the need to ensure the the 
and develop the, the, the group more granularity to human rights to a healthy and clean environment, but also to the rights of nature uh, and, and also what Justice uh, mentioned about uh, the need to complement that with obligation and ensure this environmental uh, rule of law, which also we believe is, is extremely important. Uh, all the different comments on the uh, SCP, circular economy, uh, transformation of the, the energy, the issue about uh, the linkage between health and, and uh, nature, uh, peace and, and, and nature uh, is also was also very clear, also con uh, related to the comment from Ambassador Dion, and also that we have expressed in different forums, including in the humans in, in the Security Council of the UN, about the need to really address this at all levels in all the forum to really uh, tackle uh, all the expenditures and all the uh, environmental damage that is caused by. Um, militarism, uh, armamentism, and, and war that we have conflicts, as also one of the panelists mentioned, not only the, the aggression uh, war that we have um, now, but the different conflicts that we have uh, all over the world. Uh, last last point about finance and misimplementation is was, it was also very encouraging to see what is going on in the action in different uh, tracks, uh, by reports, by the initiatives, by the central same, some central banks, but also to acknowledge uh, that is still much uh, more to be, to be done uh, in multilateral development banks. The IFIs need to really uh, move faster in, in, in aligning or ensuring that all the climate finance flows uh, are really going into this implementation phase that we need and acceleration phase that we need of uh, uh, climate and nature action and, and the synergy uh, among all of them. Uh, that goes also to plastic pollution and, and all of that. We have the G, the GEF, Either replenishment, the GCF, uh, but we have all, also many other channels to 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 ensure that that uh, support that is needed for the implementation. Uh, perhaps that that just to, to stop here. But uh, again, uh, thank for all, all those contributions. Say that uh, we uh, as co-chairs, but also as uh, Ecuador in, my, in the case of. We are very encouraged and, and uh, very motivated to see that all, not only this, all of these applicable really uh, to the discussion uh, of um, Stockholm Plus 50, but beyond also, because what is important is that Stockholm doesn't stop there, but really moves toward concrete action. Uh, and, and we really see this so encouraging also at even at the national level that we have a policy of ecological transition adopted in by the current government, and we need to really give that get that into action. A circular economy law we do have, but we need to also concrete to, to translate it into projects and, and policies and programs uh, at the local uh, level. And, and we see these some rich material and examples that that we also uh, are already looking forward to to see how we can implement it at home as well. And with that, I get back to you. And again, thank you so much for those uh, contributions that we will try to reflect in the in the new versions of those emerging messages for the Stockholm Plus City. Thank you, Corley. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Schild, for, for those uh, reflections. So um, that is the end of today's consultation. I just want to extend a big, big, big thank you to the technical team for keeping us on our toes and live throughout for the last two and a half hours. There's also a writing team that's been feverishly capturing messages and, and making notes. And of course, we have the, the recording to, to go with as well. Um, the GGKP team has posted several times uh, the websites that you can have a look at, but also um, addresses for submis submitting written statements and these kind of things. So um, we will be able to, to absorb these or, or to process these until about Monday, but then we really need to sort of go into synthesis way, uh, mode because we also want to post some of these emerging recommendations on the Stockholm Plus 50 website for those that are heading to Stockholm so that they can, can that feeds into their final preparations. But overall, thank you very much again and have a great continuation of the day. It might be evening, it might be sort of late morning for you, but I hope you have a good one. Thank you, everyone.